Good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. So for announcements, you have uh, pre-lab due this week, and then lab seven will start this week. And uh, this lab will be on diodes. So we will finish up the diode material today, and then you, you will go work a lab on, on diodes. My office hours will be right after class if you want to join. So if you have any questions about anything, stop by after class. Or if you have any questions during class, be sure to shoot me a chat or, uh, or unmute, shout out your question. Okay, so let's get back to talking about diodes. So let me switch back to the whiteboard and start up where we left off last time. All right, so this is the example we were working on last time. Um, we're working this circuit. We have a, a DC voltage source, a resistor, and a diode. And I started out by saying we're going to use this uh, approximation for the current versus voltage diode characteristic, right? Where we assume either the diode is conducting, which means the diode voltage equals the forward voltage of the diode, or the diode is not conducting, which means the diode voltage is less than the forward voltage of the diode. And so we have the circuit. This is a silicon diode. So the forward voltage is about 0.7 volts. And the problem is to find I1, the current through the diode, for a DC source voltage, well, these three voltages, 5 volts, and then 0.3 volts, and then minus 5 volts. And so we started working this problem. And we're going to work this problem uh, making one of two assumptions to start out with. Either we're assuming the diode is conducting, which means VD is VF, and then we're going to check the current to make sure the diode current is greater than zero, or we're going to assume the diode is not conducting, which means the diode current is zero, and then make sure that the diode voltage is less than VF, the forward voltage of the diode. So we started out with Vs equals five volts. I probably mentioned, you know, if Vs is five volts, I think there's going to be a way to get 0.7 volts across this diode. So I think this diode is going to be conducting. But I said, well, let's just assume the diode is not conducting to see how this turns out. So the, I said, the diode is not conducting. I wrote a KVL equation to calculate Vd, and then as, uh, assuming the current was zero, uh, we calculated VD as five volts. Well, VD can't be five volts because that would be much greater than the forward voltage. That would mean uh, current would be flowing through that diode and ID would not be zero. So then we assume the diode is conducting and that means if the diode is conducting, VF is approximately 0.7 volts. Let's check that the diode current is indeed flowing forward through the diode and we found out, yes, that's OK. Uh, using that same KVL equation, solving for current, assuming VD is 0.7, we got I1 equals 4.3 milliamps. So that was OK, because we have VD equals VF and 4.3 milliamps. And I just drew a dot right here saying, yeah, that's that could be 4.3 milliamps. But the point is, um, we have a positive current flow forward through the diode when VD equals VF. OK, so let's work the other two cases. Uh, let's work the, the problem. Let's find I1 when VS equals 0.3 volts. OK, so VS equals 0.3 volts. Right, VS is 0.3 volts. I'm going to assume that there's, well, I would naturally assume that there's no way to get 0.7 volts across this diode if the only source in the circuit is at 0.3 volts. All right. So I would assume that the diode is not conducting. But again, just to show you what would happen if we make the other assumption, just to show that assumption go wrong, uh, let's make the other assumption. So let's assume. So let's put a kind of a bar here to separate this part of the problem. Let's assume that the diode 
uh, is conducting. Okay, so we're gonna make that make that assumption. Uh, so what does that mean? If the diode is conducting, that means right, the diode is conducting. VD equals VF. That's this point on the plot right here. Right, VD equals VF. It's our assumption, and then we want to check is ID greater than zero because ID has to be greater than zero to be on this vertical line here. So I'll say ID greater than zero, question mark. Okay. Well, we have an equation we derived from KVL to find I1. So I1 equals uh, VS minus VD over R1. And so what's that equal? That equals, uh, let's see, VS is 0 0.3, VD, uh, uh, we're assuming VD is 0 0.7, right? VD equals VF, and VF is 0.7 divided by 1,000. And so this would be minus 0 0.4 milliamps. So where we would be on this plot is um, right here. We would be VD equals VF, but minus 0.4 milliamps would be below the horizontal axis. And that would mean that current is flowing backward through the diode, and, and you can't have that. So this, this, is, this is the wrong assumption. OK, so let's separate this here. So that means this assumption is wrong. The, uh, the, the diode is not conducting. Okay. So let's work out to check, well, what happens when the diode is not conducting? Okay, so the diode is not conducting. Separate this here. I'm trying to fit a lot on the board here, but I want I want you to be able to see all of this all at once. Okay, so if we assume the diode is not conducting, that means that well, the diode is not conducting. ID equals zero, and then we want to check is VD less than VF? Question mark. Right. Because if the diode is not conducting, VD has to be less than VF to be on this horizontal trace here. Well, we have a, an equation that describes VD, right? Using that KVL, VD is VS minus I, one R, one. So that's 0 0.3 minus I1 is zero. So zero times 1,000. Right. And so that's 0 0.3 volts. So we're trying to check, is VD less than VF? Well, yes, it is, because VF is 0.7 volts. And so we're going to be you know, somewhere here on the plot, right, right about there. So VD is 0.3 volts, ID is 0. That's OK using this approximation. That works out just fine. OK, so this is the. Assumption OK. OK. So what I said initially, if you have 0.3 volts VS, there's no way you're going to get 0.7 volts with this, in this circuit. So that turns out to be the right answer. So let's work the, the last part here. Uh, let's see, Vs is minus 5 volts. OK, so that's this case right here. Now I think that if Vs is minus 5 volts, 
there's no way I'm going to get a positive voltage across VD here. And I have negative five volts, which means essentially five volts with the opposite polarity. So I think this source is going to be trying to push current the opposite way, the, the reverse way through this diode, and that can't happen. So let's let's just make the let's make the right assumption, which I think is going to turn out to be the right assumption. I'm going to assume the diode uh, is not conducting. Okay. And so what does that mean for a diode to be not conducting? That means I1 is equal to zero. And then you want to check that VD is less than VF. Question mark. So we'll go back to our KVL equation here that we use to calculate VD in this circuit. So VD is VS minus I1 R1, right, that equals Vs minus 5, I1 is 0, so this is 0. So Vd is minus 5 volts. Okay. And so that, so we go back and check, can you have 0 volts through the diode? I'm sorry, 0 amps, 0 amps through the diode and negative five volts across the diode. And indeed you can, you'd be back here somewhere on the plot, right? Negative five volts, zero amps. And so that's okay. So this is an okay assumption. And, and the answer there would be, well, the, right? What is, what is I1? Well, I1 is zero. And then we checked to make sure that could be the case. All right, so this is generally how you work diode problems. You start out choosing whether you're not whether or not you're going to use this assumption. I I recommend starting out like this, right? Um, not the assumption, the approximation. Use this approximation; it gets you really close for design purposes, for analysis purposes. Um, there's some cases where if we want to know the closer to the real current that will be flowing through uh, a diode, like a light emitting diode. You might use the, the, the data sheets current versus voltage characteristic, but this is good for uh, whenever the homework problem says use this assumption, use it. And for design purposes, it gets you pretty close. But the approach is for a diode, you assume, is it conducting or is it not conducting? And then perform the checks. And if you're wrong, switch your assumption. And you might also check uh, the proper assumption. If you have more than one diode, then you have to make an assumption about each diode. And so you'd have to, let's suppose uh, you have two diodes in a circuit, you'd assume, well, both are conducting or both are not conducting, or you know, diode A is conducting, diode B isn't, or the opposite. Okay. So Okay, so th this is an approach uh, when you have DC circuits to see, or just a case maybe of a circuit that changes voltages. You know, for each voltage, you can check whether a diode is conducting or not conducting. Next, we're going to work on an example um, of a practical circuit using a diode. Uh, that circuit will convert AC waveforms to DC waveforms, much like power supplies convert voltage available at a, a home power socket, a home power outlet, converts that to DC to do things like run DC circuits and charge your phone and do great things like that. Okay, but are there any questions on what I did here before we move on to another example? All right, so let's do this. Let's get rid of this here.
And let's talk about a practical circuit that is a common application of diodes. Okay. So here's, here's what we would like. We would like uh, a circuit that takes um, an AC voltage, right? Um, say it's an AC voltage versus time. And I'll draw a box here. And we would like to convert that voltage to a DC voltage, okay? So this would be something like a, you know, again, the voltage available from a home power outlet. This would be your Arduino or your, your cell phone charging off of DC. This circuit in the middle is called a rectifier. And we're going to look at two types of rectifiers. But the function of the rectifier is to convert the general function AC to DC. And there's various reasons we use AC. We can talk about that, those at office hours if you want. But AC is used because it's easy to step up and step down voltages with transformers and the AC power system. and. Uh, DC is useful because when things run off batteries, um, batteries are DC. We're going to talk about two types of uh, rectifiers. We're going to talk about a half wave rectifier and a full wave rectifier. So let's talk about the half wave rectifier. The half wave rectifier takes advantage of, well, half of the cycle of, half the period of the sine wave of the AC signal. The full wave rectifier takes advantage of both the positive half cycle and the negative half cycle. And I'll show you that. But let's suppose that you have some voltage, some source voltage, and it's an AC voltage, and it's 10, sine omega t volts. All right, so that's a voltage source. And you would like to apply to some load. Let's just use a resistor for that load. Some load R sub L. Okay, and so we want to put something in here that is a rectifier. So let's, so in between here goes the rectifier. And let's suppose, uh, let's use the simplest circuit. We know how to do this with it's a half wave rectifier. I'm going to start out just drawing a diode here. Leave a little space to the right because we're going to add another component there. But let's just try using a diode because a diode lets current flow in only one direction. That's a good start to creating a DC signal, DC waveform, DC voltage, or DC current. Let's assume that this diode, D1, is a silicon diode. It's a silicon diode. And for a silicon diode, you can assume, unless told otherwise, that its forward voltage is approximately 0.7 volts. There are different materials, different semiconductors like um, germanium and different types of diodes like shot, uh, shot key diodes. But we're going to work with a simple diode that has a forward voltage of 0.7 volts. And LEDs, light emitting diodes, have higher voltages. We'll talk about those later. OK. In looking at the half wave rectifier, instead of writing equations out about this, let's create a plot. of uh, voltage versus time for the source 
and then also voltage versus time for the load. Okay. So our sine wave at the source looks something like this. Trying to draw sort of a sine wave here. You get the point. Okay. And that sine wave would peak out somewhere, what, about 10 volts. Right down here, this is minus 10 volts at the negative peak or at the trough. And let's look what happens um, at, at the load. OK. So from the example we just worked, you could start seeing that uh, no current is going to flow through this diode until the source voltage meets or exceeds the forward voltage, in this case, 0.7 volts. So let's suppose right here, this is 0.7 volts. That's the point at which current starts flowing. Through that resistor. So right at that point, that's where you start getting an uptick of voltage here. And in fact, that's going to happen current is going to flow through that resistor, which means there's a voltage across that load resistor. Right, That's going to happen until the source voltage falls below 0.7 volts. So you're going to get this, something like that. It's a really horrible drawing, but you get the point. This pulse of a voltage when the source is above 0.7 volts. And then the source voltage goes negative, and we saw from the previous example that no current is going to flow backward through this diode. And so no current is going to flow through this resistor, so the voltage is going to be zero across that load until, again, the source voltage goes above 0.7 volts, and then until the source voltage falls below 0.7 volts, right? So you're going to get this again. Something like that. Right? And then that repeats. Right? Dot, dot, dot. OK, so that's what happens with this circuit. Um, that has one characteristic of DC, the current flows in only one direction, but that is sure not a constant voltage. So what we do is we add a capacitor to this rectifier, or I should say add a capacitor to the circuit to create a rectifier. So the rectifier now is a diode and a capacitor. And so what happens is on this first half cycle, the voltage rises across that resistor, across that load. That is the same voltage that is applied across this capacitor, right? The load voltage is also the voltage across the capacitor. So that capacitor charges. And then when the voltage peaks out, the source voltage starts falling, but the capacitor is still charged. And so current cannot, current from that capacitor cannot go backward through that diode. The diode's a one-way valve. But current from that capacitor can go forward through the load. So you had a homework problem that said something like, you know, you connect a capacitor in parallel with a resistor, and what happens? Well, in this case, the diode, since it's not conducting, is like an open, so it's like it's not there. You have a charged capacitor that is discharging 
into that, its energy into that resistor, the current's flowing through that resistor. And so you saw in the homework that you get an exponential decay, right? Something like that. But then what happens is before that decay goes to zero, presumably, um, the source voltage goes up again and the capacitor voltage goes up again. So you get this waveform that looks like this, a rise, an exponential fall, fall a rise, an exponential fall. Well, that's not very DC either, right? That's sort of some waveform, some exponentially falling and rising waveform. But what you can do is remember the time constant determines how rapidly this exponential decay falls or how much time that takes. So if I take this capacitor and I make it really big, okay, and I take the time constant and I push it way out to the right here, I can make that, I can make that uh, decay less before I hit the next charging half cycle. And if I make that capacitor really big, right, I can extend that time constant out. So I just get barely any fall and then a little bit of a ripple and barely any fall of that voltage, right? So I can approximate DC. If I make that capacitor big enough, I could have this voltage um, vary by only maybe a few millivolts, maybe 10 millivolts, maybe 50 millivolts. So I get a little bit of a ripple here, but this largely looks DC. Now, how about the peak? Where is that? There's that peak and that approximate DC. Well, remember when current flows through that diode, causes the voltage across the resistor, uh, we have about 0.7 volts across this diode. We have 10 volts at peak for the source. So this is about 10 minus 0.7, 9.3 volts here. Okay. So there is some power being dissipated by that diode. It's not um, entire, it's not completely efficient, hundred percent efficient here. There's some power loss here, but you get a DC waveform approximately across your load. And that's what we were looking for. So someone asks on the chat, uh, if the capacitor is huge though, won't it take a long time to charge up? Will there be enough time when the diode is open for the capacitor to charge? That's a really good question. So in other words, wait a minute, doesn't it take time for that capacitor to charge up? Because, you know, we get it slowly falling, but why does it charge rapidly? Okay, well, that's because now uh, imagine, imagine you have this diode, it's conducting forward current, there's a constant voltage across it. Um, whatever voltage is across this capacitor is going to determine its charge, okay? I'm assuming a zero ohm Thevenin impedance or Thevenin output resistance here, right? So in reality, there's a little resistor here. That might be the resistor of the wire, plus if the source you know, has a little bit of resistance in it, um, or, or it's Thevenin equivalent has a small Thevenin resistance. Well, yes, but the charging time constant is going to be determined by this R and this C. And if this R is small, then you get a really small time constant. For practical purposes, when this is something like the AC power grid or a transformer connected to the AC power grid, um, this is a really small value. So, so this capacitor is going to rise very rapidly. Uh, the voltage across the capacitor is going to rise very rapidly. But then essentially it's like you took this diode and removed it when the capacitor is discharging into the load, okay? And so this decay is determined by C times um, RL. Okay, so you need a big enough capacitor to make the C times RL or RL times C time constant really big so you get this small decay. Okay, so the, the bottom line is you're going to get a rapid charging because of the small Thevenin resistance, and you're going to very, get a very slow decay if you have a big capacitor um, or a big R RC time constant created by R, L, and C. Okay, that's a good question, though. Okay, so this leads into the question, well, is there any way to take advantage of these other half cycles? They don't seem to be doing anything. And so the answer is yes. So we're going to next talk about the full wave rectifier. Okay, any other questions on this before I erase it?
All right. Nothing seen in the chat, nothing heard on the, on the Zoom call. So let's talk about the full wave rectifier. Okay, so the full wave rectifier, I'll draw the, the rectifier first because it's easier to do it that way. So I'm gonna take diodes and I'm going to take four diodes and arrange them like this. I'm going to take these these nodes, the top and the bottom node. And connect my source there. So VSFT is, we'll use the same voltage. Ten sine omega t. Like that. It's a horrible source. There. That's omega t. We'll take the load and we're going to connect the load here. Okay, so there's a little hop over here. These wires do not connect here. And leave some space. As you can imagine, I'm going to put something like a capacitor or a capacitor here. We'll connect the load here. Okay, so this is the rectifier. Let's assume that this rectifier uses um, silicon diodes where VF is 0 0.7 volts. Okay. And let's take the same approach. Let's create a plot. Source voltage and load voltage. Okay, so the source voltage looks like this. It peaks out at 10 volts. Its minimum here is minus 10 volts. Okay. Now, what I like to do in explaining this is just trace the current path uh, for the positive half cycle and the negative half cycle. So let's say that um, we have a big positive voltage. We have, a, we have Vs greater than 0.7 volts. 
somewhere up here in the positive half cycle. Current is trying to go this way if Vs is a positive value, right? So current is trying to leave the positive terminal, get into the negative terminal when Vs is positive. So let's trace out the possible current path. Right? So current gets to this point, this junction right here. Current cannot go in the reverse direction through this diode, but it can go in the forward direction through that diode. All right, so remember, it's trying to get back to the negative terminal. So I'm finding some path to get back to the negative terminal. Current cannot go backward through this diode to get to the negative terminal. It has to go through the load. current gets to this point, and it looks like it can go either way through either of these diodes in the forward direction. But remember, current is going to this lower potential here of the negative side of that source. It doesn't want to go up in potential to the positive side now that it's lost potential through these components. So it's going to go through the that diode. And finally, back to the source. So this is the current path when we have a positive voltage during the positive half cycle. Right? It goes down through the load. Okay. Let's trace out the, the negative half cycle. So the current is trying to go this way. It's trying to leave the negative terminal because Vs is negative. Get into the positive terminal because Vs is negative. Right. So let's trace out that current path. Current goes this way. Uh, current gets to this junction right here. Current will not go in the reverse direction through this diode. It will go in the forward direction through this diode. Current cannot go in the reverse direction through this diode. So it's going to go this way. Through the load. It gets to this point through this half erase diode here. Now, remember, it's trying to get the current's trying to flow to the positive terminal. That's the lower potential when Vs is negative, so not to the negative terminal. So that's the current path right there. The thing to notice is this. Whether for the whether it's the positive half cycle or the negative half cycle, current will flow down in the same direction through this load resistor. Okay. Okay, so let's now do our plot here. Let's create our plot of the load voltage. So since in either the, the, for the positive half cycle, the red path, or the negative half, half cycle, the blue path, each one of those paths goes through two diodes. So there are two 0.7 volt drops that have to be overcome before current starts flowing. So right here, this is 1.4 volts, which is two times 0.7. That's what the source voltage has to reach before current flows and current will flow until the voltage falls below that. For the negative half cycle, the voltage has to fall more negative than, one point, than negative 1.4 volts. Right, so you get something like this. So every time the source voltage crosses plus 1.4 or minus 1.4. I'm drawing one of these lines. And so I get a pulse, get another pulse, get another pulse. And that keeps going. 
So now at the load, I get a pulse of voltage for not just the positive half cycle, but also for the negative half cycle. This doesn't look much like DC, so of course we add our capacitor here. To smooth out this output waveform. If we have a small capacitor, we can observe the decay, the RC time constant, right? But if we use a very large capacitor, as I explained before, take the time constant way out to the right here, we can make this just a small ripple to produce DC from that AC input. So we get DC here from AC here. And now, um, the capacitor can actually be smaller for a given ripple because I have this negative half cycle to take advantage of for charging that capacitor. Right? So I can go roughly half half as long before I hit a charging cycle so I can use a smaller smaller capacitor. I can have a smaller time constant RC. Okay, so I can have a smaller capacitor, but I need more diodes, right? And also, right here, this peak uh, has a value of 10 minus 1.4. So this is 8.6 here, 8.6 volts, right? So instead of 9.3, I have 8.6, so I have a lower peak voltage here. I'm losing more power um, in the diodes, but I have a smaller capacitor, so. So someone says, um, are these actual mechanisms that are present in all of our charging bricks for our phones and computers? I'm going to say some, some of the charging bricks, the wall warts and the charging bricks, okay? Those that have, um, th there's another way you can, you can do uh, uh, conversion from AC to DC. You're still doing rectification, but you're using a switching power supply. So there's another approach to do this. This is common in what are called uh, linear power supplies where you have um, where you have an AC source, right? I'll just draw AC source. And then you have a, a transformer. Okay, this is a transformer magnetically coupled. So you have maybe 120 volts RMS here. You might have something like, you know, 12 volts RMS here. Okay, and then you go through your rectifier, and then you have uh, DC voltage here. Okay, so um, there there are advantages and disadvantage advantages to this kind of linear power supply. It's very low noise versus a switcher power supply, which might not use this kind of rectifier. Um, if you want to learn more about those in more detail. Uh, the, the practical electronics class in the fall, we talk about uh, switching power supplies and linear regulators. But this should get you the basic approach on how to convert AC to DC. So when you're, when you're looking at a power supply, you'll know what this is. I'll show you a schematic in a microcontroller circuit as well that, that shows this is not only used for converting AC to DC, but also making sure you have the right polarity applied here. But, all, but but I'll emphasize, yes, this is a very practical circuit. This is used in linear power supplies, usually with a transformer, if you're going from a wall voltage to, to some other voltage. Um, and you can buy what are called bridge rectifiers. These components look like this. They usually have a kind of a slot off one end with four terminals sticking out. And um, you apply AC to two of these terminals and you get DC. Um, well, you get you get this voltage. There are four four diodes in here uh, in this one component, and it has these four connections for that one component. Okay. All right. So we talked about diodes, how to analyze general diode circuits. We talked about the half wave rectifier and the full wave rectifier, and uh, power application.
So next, okay, so uh, the diode was the first semiconductor of the two that we're going to talk about before we talk about integrated circuits. Um, the diode is, is there to generally, most commonly let current flow in only one direction. And next we're going to talk about transistors. Because transistors are another useful device for controlling current into a device. You can build things like amplifiers and electronically controlled switches. Okay, so let's start off with an introduction to transistors. Okay, so transistors are, uh, are semiconductor devices that you can use to control the flow of current. Okay, so you can make an electronically controlled switch or you can create something like an amplifier. There are several different types of transistors. We're going to look at the bipolar junction transistor, but there are also other transistors that are field effect transistors, like the MOSFET and the JFET. Um, but we're going to concentrate on the BJT in this class. The bipolar junction transistor, its function is to use generally a small amount of current to control a big amount of current. So it's sort of like a current controlled current source, right? And so you're, uh, you're going to apply in these circuits and in lab, a small amount of current to one of its terminals, and then you're gonna control a large amount of current into another one of its terminals. Here's the schematic symbol for a transistor. So there are three terminals. Here's the collector terminal, it's the, terminal here on the right without the arrow. This is the base and this is the emitter. The emitter has the arrow. The arrow can either point in or point out. If you have an NPN transistor, that'll make, make sense in a second. An NPN transistor has the arrow pointing out. The current we're trying to control is this current, the collector current. Generally, this is a common way to use a transistor. So you want to control a big amount of current going into the collector, and you're going to use the base current, which is usually a small amount of current, to control that big current. And so we care about these two currents. One, one current is doing the controlling, the other current is being controlled. There are two voltages we often care about the most, and that is the base to emitter voltage. So here's double subscript notation, right? VBE, base and emitter. So VBE has its uh, positive polarity at the base and negative polarity at the emitter. Okay, so we care about that. Uh, the other voltage we often care about is VCE, the collector to emitter voltage, okay? So what the way I like to kind of start this discussion of transistors is to do a fluid flow analogy. I, I like to imagine, well, let's suppose not electrical current. We're not controlling electrical current. We're controlling water flow, water current. And so imagine you have this tank. And if you put a pipe in the bottom of this tank and open it up, gravity would pull that fluid down, OK? And so you, you might want to control that current, and you can control that current with a valve, right? So you can move a valve in and out, just imagine that, and control that current. Okay. And so this valve is going to turn, turn out to be analogous for the transistor. So let's zoom in on this valve. Right. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at how do we control essentially kind of an infinite number of positions of this valve to control, well, in this case, water or fluid, but in the transistor case, we're gonna look at how to control electrical current. But since I hit the wall on time, we're going to finish that awesome animation uh, next time. Okay, so in closing, 
Uh, don't forget you have a pre-lab due this week, and then you will perform lab six uh, this, uh, this Friday. Um, I will send out an announcement. We're going to have an exam next week, so take a look for uh, at the schedule for the scheduled time and date of the exam. It's going to happen during class, during the regular class time, just like exam one. Uh, it'll be next Wednesday. Um, but we'll talk about that more during the next class. And also, I'll send out an announcement. So thanks for joining class. Um, if you'd like to stop by office hours, I, I will start those right away. So if I uh, see you there, we'll talk then. If not, I'll see you next time. Have a great night.